Hey guys, Shulty Phillips here. We're on my March 21st DVD update. We're talking about all the DVDs and Blu-rays I've gotten over the last two weeks or so. Like I always say, guys, if you enjoyed these updates, definitely give this video a thumbs up. Leave me comments below on what some of the titles you guys have checked out recently and what you guys thought about the titles I checked out in this update. Also, thanks again for all the support on my weight loss video I just posted. I'm going to be doing more videos too, answering some of your kept questions, and I'm also trying to go through and respond to as many of them as I can. Uh, I got through a couple of them so far, but I'm going to continue in the next couple days going through them. And also, if you have more questions, Questions about weight loss, put them under that video and I'll talk about them in the next one. Uh, the first one I got from um, Shout Factory is this is definitely one of my all time favorite shows. This is one of those things that I have watched. So I think it, when I first started watching it, right when the VHSs of this first came out, and well, you know what it is is Mr. Bean, this is Mr. Bean, the whole Bean, the remastered 25th anniversary collection. But the first sketch of Mr. Bean I always remember was the swimming pool when he goes to the swimming pool and then you know was wants to go off the high dive and then gets there and gets afraid and like starts hanging over it. Um, if you guys haven't seen it though, it's basically Rowan Atkinson playing this really really odd, strange character, and he kind of goes to weird things that he does. Like, it's him going to a hotel. That was one of my all-time favorite ones, when he goes to this hotel, and um, it's all these things that go wrong. He tries to mimic this guy who's eating these fish, and, he, and he's like, all these food, and trying. he screws around with people all the time, and then he gets sick from it, and all the things that happen in the hotel. The other one that I always love is him going to the restaurant, and I can kind of relate to it. Like, he orders this food, the, the cheapest thing on the menu, because he didn't have any money, and it was something he didn't want. And it was pretty much him trying to hide the stuff. And, you know, he's hiding in people's bags and under the salt and pepper shakers. It's just such a fun sketch comedy show. And one of the ba the best sketch, you know, British th series I think there ever has been. To me, it's just such a, you know, a lot of people love Monty Python. I like Monty Python, but to me, this is just one of those things that I can watch again and again. I also love both the movies. On here, though, it has missing scenes, which is pretty cool. The old DVD releases did not have the scenes with, you know, when he's weighing the turkey and then the scene when he goes to the department store and then messes around with the chair and the woman gets smushed in it. And the other one on, was on here was him with the, um, you know, the turkey. I think some of the uh, playing with matches or a couple other ones. But to me, I was really glad because, like, I remember when I first saw them, I'm like, where are those scenes? Because I always was so used to seeing those. Also has on here the story of Mr. Bean, um, never-before-seen sketches, and the best bits of Mr. Bean, which was not on the old set, which was has new stuff with him when he was in his, Mr. Bean when he was in his attic looking over, you know, old toys and things like that and kind of having memories of them. But to me... And this is just one of those shows. It also has a booklet, you know, about the episodes. But this is just one of those things that like, if you haven't seen this, definitely give the show a chance. It's, to me, just one of the funnest shows. And I believe, too, they're going to be coming back with more episodes of the animated series, at least from what I've heard. Uh, the next one from Grindhouse Releasing is uh, Duke Mitchell's Gone with the Pope. And this is a pretty cool movie. It has a really pretty cool story behind this um, about it. It's basically, you know, a movie that... You know, Duke Mitchell, who also did, Mount, you know, Massacre Mafia style, which Grindhouse released and just put, released. Um, and, you know, he made this movie, I think, in 1976. And then he, you know, he died in 1981. He started cutting the movie, and he ended up running out of money and never ended up being able to complete this movie. So it was a movie that was never finished. And the guys at Grindhouse releasing, you know, when they wanted to put out uh, Massacre Mafia style, when they were talking to his son, you know, the son said, oh, you know, he has this movie that, you know, we have in the garage that, you know, he never finished. We have all the negatives. So they got this, I believe, in like 1990-something. It was kind of talking about, you know, in the features about how they, you know, pieced it back together and had to try and f work off of like napkins and all kinds of random stuff because there was never a script and things like that and they believed he was kind of making this up as he went along some of it but it's an amazing weird movie about him as this guy who's you know hired by like the mob you know, just right when he gets out of jail to do this job and then he comes up with this idea afterwards that he's going to go to you know Italy and basically kidnap the Pope and it's kind of about him, the, the guys that he brings with him and their plan to kidnap the Pope and, you know, how he's going to do it and things like that. And there's some really weird scenes in this, too. This one scene when he's like, goes to the, um, like, area where these ducks are and he's, like, feeding them, you know, pieces of, like, popcorn. And so there's just, like, some really weird scenes and some of the weird... It's just, it's a very odd, strange movie. And Grindhouse Leeson did an amazing job cleaning this up. And they show, too 
how bad the print was with all these scratches and the, and the color and everything was so off. It was all tinged yellow and looked awful. And it showed how they, you know, were able to clean this up and it really looks good. I mean, they talk about how some of the scenes were out of focus because, like, when they were shooting it, they the guy was doing the sound and the focusing at the same time, so some stuff ended up out of focus from that. But also, just like with all the Grindhouse releasing stuff, too, they have hidden features in here, so you have to look around. And I really like that because, like, like I guess I said before, to me that's a really pretty cool thing they do. Because I, I remember like the early days of DVD. I always remember when you would go and there would be hidden things. What also has in here, you know, too, you know, a booklet about the movie, you know, like some notes about it, and then a poster too that you could put up, you know, for the movie. And I guess this poster was done, you know, recently because I'm sure there wasn't a poster for the movie, you know, when it was made since it was never finished. But this is the one that has also has, has, you know, interviews in here with, you know, finding the cast members in this movie and them telling stories about it and things like that. Like, a, I think it's like an hour and 20 minute thing about that. But to me, this is, you know, really cool movie. They've also just announced they're going to be putting out Cannibal Holocaust and I believe Pieces on Blu-ray, which I can't wait to, you know, talk about those ones. And the next one from Paramount is Interstellar, you know, Christopher Nolan's new movie. It also has a thing in here, a collectible, you know, film cell from the movie. But I really like this one. I saw this in theaters, really like this one a lot. I love these kind of space movies that have, like, kind of a cool, like vibe to them and I thought this to me this was a really well done space movie I know it had some mixed opinions and things like that but to me I thought it was really cool you know it starts Matthew McConaughey's this guy who's gonna be going on this mission to space you know to try and save you know mankind but he knows he's gonna be away for all these years and that's some real sad stuff to it too because there's some cool aspects of this movie where like going to where they go you know with one of the planets like if they they're there it's like the years go by like every like couple seconds or something like that on this planet ends up being like a year in, and there's like this insane stuff like with them coming back and then the other guys all age it's like I love these kind of things and you know it just it had just this real sad vibe and like he didn't age at all and everyone around him was because it was going by all these years it was just a really trippy weird kind of hard to explain movie about you know what exactly he was doing and what this mission was about and what you know what he's trying to save and things like that it has on here a bunch of, you know, features about it, you know, the origins of the movie and then, you know, creating the visual worlds and things like that. But like I said, I really love this movie. It was a really cool space movie. I don't want to talk about too much about what happens in it because one of those movies is cool if you just see it and experience the whole thing. Like I said, not, it had, like I said, it has had these mixed vibes, but I really love this. I, to me, when I think of space movies in the last while, this I think is to me one of the better ones in a long time. Now, the next group of titles, it's really pretty cool. You know, Arrow Films is a company, you know, it's you know been exclusively in the UK. You know, it's been Region B, Blu-rays. And, you know, they finally have a new line of releasing titles in the U.S., you know, Arrow. Um, so basically, they're doing titles that are Region A and B. So then they have the U.S. line. And the first batch of titles, also, like, to me, Arrow Films is kind of like, um, you know, the Shout Factory of the UK. So it's kind of cool that we have two companies now that are two, like, really high-class titles companies like this that are putting out a lot of stuff. Because Arrow has got a bunch of stuff coming up, like um, Society, you know, the U.S. Blu-ray, a bunch of features on that. Um, Spider Baby, which is, can't wait to see their, their transfer on that. Because they do an amazing job on their transfers. And the first batch of titles from them is um, Day of Anger, which is a spaghetti western film, which is pretty much... At this guy who's like in the town, who um, is pretty much like the guy who cleans things up and not really, you know, people like kind of walk all over him. And this gunslinger guy comes in the town and kind of teaches him about you know you know shooting and tries to train him so he can kind of defend the town. Um, you know, here's a little look inside the cases. They do such a cool job on their artwork, on the, the discs, and they all have reversible covers as well underneath of them so you can switch out the covers. And, you know, they have booklets in here about the movie and, you know, stories and things like that about it and pictures and stuff like that. Um, and they also, this one has a brand, you know, like I said, a brand new transfer on this. And um, it also has the Italian cut of the movie, which is a longer cut of the movie. And a bunch of interviews and, you know, unreleased things and trailers and, and things like that. Uh, the next one from them is um, Blind Woman's Curse. The same with this one. has. Yeah, I knew the disc was going to come out. This thing had cracked on it. But, you know, it's got pictures inside of here. Like I said, too, this one has got a reversible cover as well. Uh, I don't want to, like, show everything about it because I mean, if you guys pick it up, you guys can see this stuff. But, like I said, pictures. This one is about this um, 
this you know woman who ends up becoming blinded by another woman, and it's about her you know pretty much going around killing people, getting revenge on the the uh, these you know the tribe of the you know the, the ninjas and things like that. So this one's very hard for me to explain, but this one is my favorite one, and I absolutely love this movie. It's weird. I saw this movie years back, I think in 2004 when the first Blu-ray came out. This is Mark of the Devil. This was my favorite of the first batch of titles. Like I love this movie. Um, you know, I don't think there's anything that graphic in this thing, but, you know, the picture's in here, and, yeah, I can't show that one, but, um, you know, some pictures and things like that from the movie, and this one also has a reversible cover as well underneath, um, this one is basically about, you know, this one stars Udo Kier, and this is about, like, the time when they were, like, people going around hunting for witches, and it's kind of like the story of that, and Udo Kier worked for this guy who is you know, one of the head, like, witch hunters in this town, and one of this, this woman that Udo Kier ends up meeting in the movie is, ends up being accused of, of being a witch and locked away, and Udo Kier's character is starting to kind of realize that this witch hunting thing is not really real, and it's all kind of for the gain of these people to take away their money and kill them and things like that and get their possessions and all that kind of stuff. There's insane torture stuff, and this, this is, like, really early on, I think this was shot in 1968, so this was, like, really different for the time and really shocking. Even today holds up for some of the torture stuff that's in this, but holds up as a pretty shocking movie. Has on here too, like I said, an amazing new transfer on this. And the music in this kind of reminded me of the music they went and they did in Cannibal Holocaust a little bit. Almost like Cannibal Holocaust might have lifted a little bit of this sound in this movie. But it has on here, you know, a cool feature that I liked going now in 2000, they did it in 2014 though, going and showing the locations where this movie was filmed and seeing what they look like now. But this one I highly recommend. It's like, it was like cool, really cool artwork on this one. Just a cool witch hunter thing. And the one guy in this is like terrible. Like he's, you know, purposely, if like women don't want to sleep with him and things like that, he goes and you know, comes after them, and, like, the woman that he likes gets put away because they believe that she put, like, a curse on this town, and I don't know, I just, like, to me, this was such a cool movie, really cool movie. And the next one from MPI's line, Gorgon Video, which they brought back, you know, recently with Death Spa, and they have, I think they have some other things coming up as well. Really cool. And the next one from MPI's line, you know, Gorgon Video, which is, like, you know, does a, put out a lot of, like, kind of super gory films, and then some kind of different, like, lesser-known movies, and I don't believe this movie has ever been released, these movies, either of them, you know, The Roommates or Wound for All Men, have ever been released on anything before. They're kind of like lost movies. And this one, um, my favorite one on here is Roommates. The transfer on it was amazing, like, really nice transfer on this. And it's pretty much about these girls who, like, a group of these friends and a couple other different characters that are, like, at, um, one's, like, a librarian, one's, like, at a kid's camp, like a summer camp, and it's kind of goes around them, kind of all what they're doing while they're there. The one's like relationship with this guy who's like a much older man. But the the the, the kind of what's going on, why this is all going on, is um, the kind of funny plot of it. Which is like you see somebody, you know, this woman going around killing people. And the way they film it is kind of comedic a little bit. And it's, it's just like, I, I don't know, I love the aspect of like the the killer in this movie. And you kind of are wondering who is the killer? And I'm kind of I kind of had like opinions that I kind of was thinking it was this person, you think it's that person, but that's pretty much what it is, is the killer going around killing people in this town while they're all kind of just doing their own thing in this town. But it's just a really great exploitation like kind of weird forgotten movie with some cool music and just a cool vibe. The whole thing to the movie was really pretty cool. Woman for All Men though was I didn't like that one as much. Um, because they, I felt like The Roommates just stood out to me as just such a cool movie. But it has on here, you know, a featurette with um, the director, you know, Arthur Marks and one of the actresses in the movie for both of them. And the next one from Sony is Annie. Tomorrow, tomorrow, I'll love you. Tomorrow, you're only a dream I never saw the original Annie movie. I always, you know, think, think of it, I think of Serum Mom, and that woman's watching Annie, and she gets beat with Serum Mom on the head with the thing, and then in Camp Nowhere, when they put on that play to fool the family like they were actually at the camp, they thought. You know, that's what I think of Annie. But, you know, I actually saw this in theaters as well. I actually like this movie. Like, I, I had no problem with this. I know it had some kind of mixed opinions and things like that, but the movie's basically, you know, about, you know, 
Annie, who's this orphan, who's at this orphanage with, you know, taken care of by, um, you know, like a foster home by, you know, Cameron Diaz character, who's kind of mean and kind of like bossy and kind of telling them what to do and kind of putting them down and things like that. And one day Annie almost gets hit by a car and she gets saved by, you know, Jamie Foxx's character. And Jamie Foxx is running for office and, and someone ends up filming when this happens. And he gets the idea that, oh, he should be seen with this girl and then take care of her and take her in you know, to help the polls and things like that, but he ends up starting to kind of caring for her and they actually become friends and things like that. So if you know the story, that's pretty much what it is. But, you know, on the basis of, you know, a musical in the background and everything like that, like I said, I enjoyed this and it has on here, you know, deleted scenes and bloopers and a day on set and um, a bunch of other different things on this. But I enjoyed this. I thought this, this was a fun one. Like I said, I've never seen the original one, so I can't base it on that, though. Uh, the next one from Warner Brothers is IMAX's Island of the Lemurs, uh, Madagascar. And what's funny is right when this first started in the beginning, you know, I was thinking like, this reminds me of Pee Wee, the music, like the theme music. And then I, then I looked it up and it was Mark Mothersbach who did the theme and some of the, thong, so, the songs in you know, Pee Wee's Playhouse, you know, which they're making the new Pee Wee movie, which I can't wait to see that. But, you know, he did the songs in this, especially the opening one. You're going to really feel like it's like Pee Wee. It had that total vibe to it. Which hopefully they get him to do some, at least the theme or two for the new movie, and then maybe Danny Elfman to do some other ones. Um, and the movie's basically about the lemurs and kind of about the story about them and how they've been around for 60 million years and well, lots of millions of years. But it's basically, you know, like a documentary, though, following, you know, them around and, like, showing what they do and then showing a place where they take care of them and keep them protected and things like that. I always like these kind of movies, and they're always, like, so well filmed, like, amazing cinematography on this. You know, this one's narrated by Morgan Freeman and has on here the making of the movie and behind the scenes and a couple other, um, you know, featurettes on this. But I thought this was a really well done. It also looks really cool in, in 3D. Uh, the next one is the final part of the Hobbit trilogy, you know, the Hobbit, the Battle of Five Armies. So, you know, after this one, you technically would start watching Lord of the Rings films. This, you know, has a cool ventricular cover. Um, but this, you know, just picks up right where the other one left off. You know, you know the story, the, you know, the, the I, I never can remember the names. There's Bill Baggins is basically on this quest with the, um, I can't, I, I never remember, the, you know, with the dwarves characters to get them back to their homeland, you know, because their castle has been taken away from them. And, you know, this one involves the dragon and the big fight with the orgs and things like that. I'm never good at explaining these kind of movies for some reason. But I thought this was a really pretty cool movie. And, you know, like if you know these movies, you know the last one. You can't, It's kind of like you have to see this one. You know, it looks absolutely outstanding in 3D. Has on here, too. You know, they have, you know... You know, he always does really cool documentaries on the making of these movies because they're such undertakings to put together. They're, they're, you know, they spend years working on these, especially for the Lord of the Rings movies. Those are the ones I need to rewatch again. And I'm sure there's going to be new editions of them, too, down the line. Especially, I'm sure there's going to be down the line, like, a collection of all three of these Hobbits together. And, you know, you know, maybe... I don't think they could ever put one on one disc because it would be just too long. But, you know, if you haven't seen this one, definitely check this out. But I feel like everyone who saw the last ones is definitely going to want to check this one out. Uh, the next one from Disney is Into the Woods, and this is one of the Disney ones that I saw recently. I, and I saw Cinderella a couple days ago. Loved that one. Like, Cinderella was more what I kind of was hoping this one would be. Because, like, this one, I liked it, but I did not love it. There's parts of this that I did not like. Like, Cinderella, like, that one, I could watch that again. Like, again, you know, like, re like I feel like it's one of those ones you could watch a lot. Like, I thought when it came to, you know, you know fairy tale movies, it was one of them really, to me had that kind of vibe almost of like the Cheryl Duvall's fairy tale theater and that kind of one. I mean, this one was based on, you know, the stage play Into the Woods. And, you know, it has a good cast in this. Meryl, Meryl Streep, Emily Blunt, Anna Kendrick, Chris Pine. Johnny Depp is in it for a little bit as the wolf. Really quick part, though. He's not in it a whole lot. But basically about Emily Blunt's and James Corden's character. And, you know, Emily Blunt, because a curse was put on the family, is not able to get pregnant. And Meryl Streep's character comes and says to them, you know, if you go do this quest and find these items that I need you to find, then, you know, the curse will be lifted from you and you'll be able to have kids and things like that. But it's kind of like a musical thing going along the whole way of finding the characters and it's all based in the woods. So they're always going, into the woods, into the woods we go. And, like, I feel like the movie needed to be trimmed a little bit. Like, some of it, to me, went on a little bit. And, like, when it comes to musicals, like, I just didn't feel like it was my favorite musical. I know a lot of people, like, really like this one. But, like I said, when you compare it to Cinderella, which just, just came out, like, that I loved. 
and had that real Disney magical feel. This didn't have that to me. But it has on here a never before seen song, you know, an original song that they didn't use in the movie. And then, you know, some featurettes and a commentary and things like that. Like I said, I enjoyed this, but it just wasn't perfect to me. The next one was one of those movies where, I, going into it, I didn't know. Because, like, sometimes movies like this could be a little bit boring and, you, you know, you don't know. And I was surprised that I really, like, got into this movie and, like, really liked this. And I was glad that I did, and it was, that it wasn't sort of an overhyped kind of movie. And it was, um, you know, from Anchor Bay, and it's the imitation game. You know, it's Benedict Cumberbatch and Kira Knightley. And I love this movie. Like, I really did. I feel like it's a lot of movies that some people might be like, oh, like I, like I was thinking, oh, it might be kind of boring, and I don't know, and I don't know if I'm going to like this. But I like this. It was all, all during the time of the war in Germany, and Benedict Cumberbatch is this guy who is like extremely smart when it comes to puzzles and doesn't really like working with other people. It's a true story too. And he basically is brought in to try and solve the, there's a, all this crazy encryption process that the German army had when they would send messages so Americans and other, you know, troops and things like that couldn't, you know, figure out what they were saying. So as he's basically going and trying to decipher this machine, this, you know, um, really advanced machine and, he ends up, you know, coming up with the idea of building this machine to, you know, do that to disciple the machine. And he ends up, you know, you know, working with Keira Knightley's character. And there's some really kind of sad aspects of this movie because it's, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch's character is gay. And this is the time where, you know, if you're out about this, it's like a crime and things like that. So he kind of has to cover it up and he starts to kind of, you know, pretend to be with Keira Knightley's character, and she's not really aware of it. It's really rather sad, the whole thing. Because, like, especially some of this stuff, because, like, the guy was really good, but he also didn't care about some people sometimes. And you didn't know if he was being honest like this or he was just telling people this. And, and to me, I found it really sad. It was like a very sad movie, but a really well done movie. It has on here, you know, a making of, deleted scenes, and a Q&A session. But definitely give this one a chance. I really like this. And the next one from Anchor Bay is Muck. This is one of these ones that I was not too excited to review this just because, like, I like to find really good things about movies and always look for the positive and things like that. This one, I just had some problems with this movie. Um, I really wanted to see this one, you know, because Lauren Francesca was in this movie. Work with her a couple years back on a movie. So I was really interested in seeing this. You know, I, I, there's this one I just really wanted to see. Like, the trailers look pretty cool to it. But it was just, like, weird. It had this weird thing about it. Like, the movie's technically the middle movie. Like, there's going to be a one before and then one after. But, like, that's kind of a weird thing to do. Because you never know if you're going to have the money or, you know, the interest to make the prequel and then the sequel. And, like, just to kind of start the movie, like, all of a sudden, it makes it almost seem like something wasn't filmed or something happened or, like, what happened. And there was, like, weird stuff, too, like, trying to make it look like there was the one girl, you know was the one naked in it and they had like this and they blurred the name at the end because I don't know what the hell happened with that and it was like because the way they're not showing her face and stuff it was like I could I could tell what they were doing I wasn't stupid I knew what was going on with it and it had some kind of weird shots from like the like zooming in on butts and like it was like but weird the way it was done wasn't like kind of like comedic or kind of funny and things like that it was like done just a weird kind of odd way, which I'm like, didn't care for it. And then they had Kane Hodder in this movie, and Kane Hodder was so underused, and it's like poor, the most poorly used I've ever seen him, to have him in this, had him in this bald cap, and, you know, as these kind of monsters in it that weren't explained at all. And, you know, and then, you know, he was like coming after them, and it was filmed really cringy and weird, and I don't know. And then it starts off with these, the friends out in the woods, and then they're, you know, messed up, you saw something happen to the one guy, like I said, you don't have any idea what happened, because it's the break walls and been filmed and you know they get to the house and then they're in there and then the one gets taken and this it was just a mess and like I said I always try to look for good things in movies and I hate being mean about movies and I hate finding negativity in this thing but this was a disaster it was bad 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 and not fun bad 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 like if Roger Ebert said this he would have had it in this hated 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 it movie book it was that kind of thing and I, I'll watch the other ones because I want to know what the hell they're going to do with it and what the hell they're going to explain in the beginning but it was just a mess, and it was really, like, strange and kind of cringy, and I don't know. I really wanted to like it, but I couldn't. Uh, the next one from, you know, Anchor Bay is The Immigrant. It's about a woman who goes to America with her sister, immigrant, immigrates there, and, you know, her sister is, like, sick and ends up being put into quarantine, and 
and the sister is the other sister is just about to be sent back, and she ends up meeting at the border patrol. And I couldn't figure out exactly who he was, but he was Joaquin Phoenix's character. And I thought at first he worked for the place, but then it, like he didn't. But he like ended up basically paying off so he could take her, and then wants her to come and work for him. And his vi business is really kind of skeezy and kind of weird. And, you know, he has this burlesque, burlesque business and then he has prostitution on the side. And the woman has to do all these terrible things to, to you know, make money. And, but, and she doesn't really have anywhere else she can go because the person she was coming to see, her cousins, really don't want her there. And they're trying to send her back. It's really kind of very sad, the things she goes through. And she, she ends up meeting Jeremy Renner's character, who's this magician and, you know, he ends up, you know, liking her and kind of wanting to help her. And that's essentially what the story is. But it's a really good character piece. Has on here, too, a, you know, a feature commentary. And then, you know, a feature on the visuals of the movie. But I like this one. I thought it was a pretty well done, you know, character period piece movie. Uh, the next one from Troma is Rabbit Grannies. And this is one I think back to, like, the early days of Troma. Like, when I was seeing Troma movies that were not the ones that Lloyd Kaufman did. This was always, like, one of the ones I remembered seeing in the very beginning. Because it was one of their early... DVD releases and it, back when they had like the Troma Intelligent Test and all those kind of things. And what's cool is they included the old DVD on here. It's got a new cover on it because I think the old one was released by the company Axis, AIX, which I don't think is existing anymore. But they put like a new thing on it. But the disc itself, like the stuff on it is the actual original pressing disc. And, um, you know, technically though, the Blu-ray isn't really HD exactly. It's kind of the most, you know, the best that they have of the thing because it's basically you know, the more uncut edition than you've ever seen. It's a shorter cut, but it's got more of the gore in it because the original one had a lot of the gore cut out of it and things like that. But this is a movie about this one family member that puts a curse on the, um, you know, sends them this gift that puts a curse on these two grandmothers and they end up, you know, starting eating the family members and turning like crazy. It's just a really fun, weird, you know, movie about, you know, super gory and kind of things like that. Like I said, this is when I think back to like the early days of trauma titles that were not their ones, the ones that they distributed it, you know, and picked up from other people and things like that. This is one of the ones that I always remember. Um, and I'm also going to be putting out, I saw two really soon, Class of Newcomb High 2, you know, the original 2, not Return to Newcomb High Part 2. Uh, the next one from Lionsgate is a Jason Statham movie, and I think this had like a real limited theatrical run. Like, I don't think it really came out too many places, but it's, um, you know, the movie Wild Card. It's Jason Statham, and he basically... It's kind of this guy who does a bunch of different random things. He kind of is like a bodyguard and things like that in Vegas. But he also, like, helps people out by, like, one this one guy. He pretends like he's going to beat him up and, like, says bad stuff to Sophia Viagra's character, for his character, and, like, tricks him and to make him look better because, like, the guy stands up to him and knocks Jason, you know, um, Statham's character out and things like that, and but he basically finds out that this one woman that he really likes is a friend of his, and it was, you know, beaten up by this one guy, and he basically goes to try and get revenge on him, and by doing that, he ends up making all the people that are with the guy, like the bad people, come after him, so it's kind of like him kind of trying to, like, live and, you know, get after him, so it gets kind of like the Taken kind of vibe, like a revenge and things like that. I thought this one was all right. But not, like, perfect. It had a lot of people in this, though. It had, like, Stanley Tucci and Jason Alexander, you know, Anne Heche, and a bunch of different people in it. It wasn't, like, Jason Statham's, to my opinion, like, the best movie. The director did his other movie, I believe, The Mechanic, but I like that one a lot more, though. Uh, the next one from Lions Gate for, you know, the After Dark, um, you know, Horror Fest line. I believe it's, I don't think it's called Horror Fest anymore. I think it's just called After Dark, the line. And it's Housekeeping. This one was, was okay, but there was something weird about the like the way it looked. Like I don't know if they, they shot it on really inexpensive cameras or something, because like it was all so white, like it was so blown out, and it was like I think if it was shot so much like that, the detail was kind of lost, and you couldn't do too much about it like that. I know it's more of a technical thing, but it was kind of bugging me a little bit just because of how white and kind of strange and uncolor corrected the movie looked. But it's basically about this med student who. You know, she, her brother is always, you know, getting in trouble with the law and things like that. So she's going to, you know, basically she's going to get this, you know, going to get to med school and things like that. She has to give up, you know, her scholarship money and things like that to bail the brother out. So she ends up getting this job as a housekeeper. And it's going to be like a couple, it's like a couple week thing. And 
you know, the, it starts off kind of normal, but the woman's like writing all these notes, like do this and do that and do this and, you know, clean the toilets. And it starts out like that, but then it starts getting weird and starts to getting these kind of odd things and weird requests and it starts getting worse and worse. And that's pretty much what the movie was. Like I said, it was okay, but it wasn't like anything amazing. Um, the next one's from Warner Archive, and this is one that I had always wanted to see, and it's, you know, a movie I watch a lot of Eric Roberts movies, and this is like one of the movies that like he's always known for. Gave an amazing performance in this. Is this is Star Eighty? Um, you know, this is about the Playboy playmate who was murdered by, you know, in real life by the character that Eric Roberts plays, and it's pretty much about how she gets discovered, and Eric Roberts, you know, starts representing her and taking, you know, getting her to Playboy, and you know, when she starts getting into movies. But Eric Roberts' character is very like stalkerish and very strange, and he's kind of always around, and 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 you see in the beginning of the movie that he's killed her. And it's kind of flashing back to what led up to this. And the uh, the end scene in this is amazing. Like Eric Roberts' acting in this was so good. I mean, it was a lot different than he is now because, like, I feel like he hasn't gotten the chance to do these kind of roles again. I would love to see him do something this deep and this intense again because he's so good. And like I said, he is amazing in this movie. Where Miller Hemingway plays the Playboy Playmate character, but it's just a really well done movie. Uh, the next one kind of has the vibe of Who Slew Annie Rue, and the kid in this was actually in Who Slew Annie Rue years later. I think the actor that played him is, like, coming back for the first time in a movie, like, after, like, 30 years or something. And the girl, I think, from the Secret Garden movie in 1994 is going to be in it as well. But, like I said, it has that Who Slew Annie Rue kind of vibe to this. It's about this, like, really religious family whose mother is, like, really sick and ends up dying, and they end up kind of... You know, the little girl who lives in the lane kind of took a little bit from this, a little bit. And it's kind of about, um, you know, she dies, they end up burying her in the garden. There's kind of weird stuff, the way the kids are acting. And they want to, basically, they don't want to tell anybody. They want to kind of keep this quiet and, you know, forge her signatures and things like that. So they can kind of keep living, going to school, doing all the stuff, but kind of blending in and not having anyone know that the mother's dead so they don't have to have get taken away or things like that. But then they find out that they have a father and then the father all of a sudden comes back and when he comes back it's what happens. But it was just a really cool, different kind of weird movie. It was definitely kind of weird for the time. It's the whole vibe of the whole movie. Uh, the next one from Cartoon Network is Uncle Grandpa. And I've never seen any of these before. And this is a pretty funny, kind of trippy show. Kind of has like a vibe of like Ren Stimpy mixed with Spongebob mixed with like Tim and Eric kind of humor and things like that. And it's Uncle Grandpa the Good Morning. And it's about this character character named Uncle Grandpa. And there's like kind of two of him in certain times. And one of them that I love was to hear him going on vacation. And he goes to this place and all he wants to do is eat hot dogs. And this tribe there believes that he's like the person who can stop the volcano. And just a really weird, quirky show with weird characters. Uncle Grandpa's character is like always helping people and things like that. Has a bunch of different episodes on here. I think kids really like this one. It's one of those things, too. Definitely has got humor for adults and stuff like that. I, I like those kind of shows that are, like, really weird and out there. The next one is one, you know, and this movie is one of those movies that kind of, like, when you say, oh, a movie can be kind of, like, not great, but it's, like, amazingly fun and, like, lives on to me as something that I'm always going to remember and, like, watch again if I want to watch, like, a really fun, odd movie. And this is from... Um, whacked movies and this is revolution 666 and this is like the epiphany of like a fun weird movie and like it films like in walmart or like this market and it films like in front of like arby's and places like that it's like oh i, I like like it's like but can't imagine what the people on the street were thinking when they were doing some of this and and like the adr and it was really pretty odd and didn't match and that, like, all that stuff made it amazing to me but it's about this like this cult, this really weird cult, and the guy kind of looked like Judah Freelander a little bit, and they, you know, have this CD, this song, and it gets sent to this this uh, DJ, and I was kind of calling him DJ B. Curtis, but his name was Curtains, but I was adding that to it in the song. But, but basically, he, you know, plays this song on the radio, and it ends up bringing back this kind of zombie character, and the zombie character goes to a hard rock cafe and finds this mask of the walrus, and wears it around and goes and starts killing people and the killing scenes are really odd and close up and you, I don't know and then the the DJ guy you know, is going around and you know the Walsh is guy is coming after him and I don't know it's amazing everyone you gotta watch this if you want to watch a fun really strange movie watch this um, the next ones are from Olive Films and it's how to beat the high cost 
of living. And this has, you know, Susan St. James, Jane Curtin, and Jessica Lange. Really early movie for all of them. I believe it was like 1980 it was done. Might have been shot a year or so before. It's about these girls who all have kind of, you know, one thing in common, which is all have, you know, need money. You know, one of them's boyfriend just left them. One of them's having, like, a fight with their husband and, like, can't work where they work anymore because the husband's trying to sue her because they're not agreeing on things. And they come up with this idea because the mall has kind of have this big giveaway thing where they give away, like, a million dollars inside of this thing. And there's really cool stuff in an old 80s mall in this. And they pretty much are playing this thing to try and rob it. So it's them kind of figuring out how they're going to rob and get the money out of the thing. Uh, I feel like I might have seen some of this movie before, but I don't know. I feel like it's a real forgotten, like, less spoken about movie. But they, you know, it's basically them putting together the plan to try and get the money and what happens and things like that. Just a really fun, real, you know, dated but fun movie. Uh, the next one is kind of like, um, I think there was a first movie of this, and it's a little bit like an Indiana Jones kind of movie. Back when they were kind of like making a lot of movies kind of like this, and I believe this was made by Canon Pictures. You know, and Canon was kind of notorious for making a lot of those kind of movies at the time. And this is Alan Quarterman and the City of, Lo of Gold, and it's pretty much about him going on an expedition to try and get to this like hidden lost city. And, you know, when they get there, there's like all these kind of traps and like really crazy stuff of like melting and like that kind of thing. It's like an adventure kind of Indiana Jones kind of movie. And then when they get to the vibe, the villain in this is that Henry Silva, who's really cool. He was also in that movie Thirst and a whole bunch of movies in the 70s and 80s. Really cool, crazy looking villain in this movie. This stuff really cool. Well, it has a good new transfer on this as well. And the last one, this one wasn't perfect, but it was okay. It's the Roy Scheider film Night Game. And the stuff that was the best in this, really, was the stuff with the killer at the theme park and outside the theme park, like this kind of carnival. That I really liked, and they were kind of cool film and things like that. It was kind of, like, talky a little bit, and but it was about, like, this killer that's going around and killing people after baseball games and things like that. And the, the police officer's trying to find him and trying to figure out the motive and things like that. And he's always killing them out this kind of pier kind of uh, area by the beach. But it was okay, but it's like kind of those things that wasn't perfect, and I, um, anything like that. But I, li I liked it, though, for that stuff. But it just well, isn't one that I think like we really live on a whole lot. And um, the next one is one of these movies I wanted to let you guys know is you know out now. I believe it's out next week, so you guys can pre-order this. And it's from Wild Eye Releasing. It's one of the ones that I'm actually in like the, pretty much the whole movie, throughout the whole movie. Um, and it's Fat Planet. And it's, I, to me, though, I think you guys are going to dig this movie. It's like a fun, you know, kind of odd vibe movie about this planet where everyone's overweight. And they kidnap a fitness instructor to try and help them lose weight. And, um, you know, Priscilla Barnes is this movie. The one actress in this movie is one of the main girls who's in uh, the Pitch Perfect movies. So she's in this movie as well. So she's, like, throughout the whole movie is one of the leads in this movie. But, you know, here's me in the back of it. Um, like I said, I, I, I think you guys are going to dig this movie. And if you guys check it out, please let me know what you guys thought. I'm going to be talking about it more as well coming up. Uh, the next one from Synodyme is Song 1 with, you know, Anne Hathaway. And this one, her brother ends up in, in a coma. She hasn't seen her brother in years. So she comes back to, you know, the city to try and, you know, hopefully, hopefully the brother wakes up and things like that. And she kind of looks through his, his things and finds this book and kind of is sort of trying to, you know, figure out more about the brother, kind of get to know him, even though she can't because he's in the coma. And she wants to kind of look into what he likes and she starts like going to see shows that he likes and she ends up meeting one of these magi musicians that she really that he really liked and they kind of become his friends and like a relationship and things like that. Has a whole bunch of cool, you know, music scenes in this too, like Dan Deacon and performances and things like that in it. I thought this was a pretty cool, you know, love story kind of movie. There's a lot of kind of movies like this one, but I thought this was pretty well done. Uh, the next one from um, Parade Deck Films is motivational growth, you know, with Jeffrey Combs. This is a really kind of quirky movie about this guy who's like a real shut-in, is always living in his, you know, his, doesn't ever leave, he's always make, making a mess, eating all this food, and he ends up, you know, getting knocked out one time, waking up, and then his mold starts talking to him, because he's like suicidal and all depressed, and the mold in the corner of the room starts talking to him and telling him things and trying to help him, but you kind of think, like, the mold may not be out you know, for his best interest and things like that. There's some really crazy, gory things in this as well. Um, it has commentary on this, and um, like I said, Jeffrey Combs plays the voice of the mold in this. And the last one from um, Film Chest is One Step Beyond. This has 70 episodes of this, so it has, like, most of the episodes. There's a couple missing from this. This is a show that was kind of like, 
you know, Twilight Zone and Outer Limits, but it was like right, started like a year or two after, I believe, or maybe a year or two before. Yeah, a year before the Twilight Zone. So it started right before the Twilight Zone. And it's kind of about like real stories about like paranormal or, you know, encounters and things like that that people have and they kind of reenact it and things like that. Pretty cool show. You know, some episodes are better than other and things like that. But they're actually pretty good transfers on these. And it has a, you know, a book thing, you know, about the episodes that are on it. But it's actually really pretty decent transfer to these because I know there's been a lot of like public domain -y kind of editions of these in the past. But anyway, though, guys, that's all for this update. Thanks again for watching and subscribing. Definitely give this video a thumbs up. Let me know what you guys thought about the titles I checked out, and I'll see you guys later.